Can we start with a word of prayer today? Father, thank you for the privilege that we have to meet together as a church body. Lord, thank you for your blessings upon this ministry. Lord, not only at this moment in history, but Lord, the way that you have used this church, this school, and its ministries in the lives of hundreds and thousands of people. We're honored, Lord, that you have allowed us to be a part of it. And Father, we pray for your continued blessings on our ministry. Lord, now as we begin a a partnership with Calvary Christian Academy, Father, I pray that together we would be able to make a difference here on this corner and in this community. Thank you so much for the legacy. And Lord, we could mention scores and scores of people, beginning with Dr. Ackerman and so many others who have ministered, Lord, all the way down to our present staff and Dr. Hill. Father, we thank you so much for them. And Lord, I I just pray, Lord, for our church. We pray for your continued blessings. I pray for Jonas and Rachel today. Lord, thank you for blessing them. And we're excited to see their family grow. And we're excited to see our church grow as their family grows. Lord, thank you for all the new people that you're bringing into our midst. And Lord, we just pray that today that you would speak to our hearts. We love you, and it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bible, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. You might have your phone, your iPad. I'd encourage you to turn along with me. We'll read a few verses in just a moment. As many of you know, Vicki and I were, were missionaries in Mexico for 10 years, a few years ago. Matter of fact, I think I have a picture of us when we went to Mexico back in 1987. We were missionaries. Do we have that picture? Do we put that up there? Is it there in the PowerPoint? Look at that. Look at that. That was little Justin back in 1987. That's when uh, we went to Mexico as missionaries. Well, we spent 10 years there. Upon our arrival in a city called Querétaro, our first major task was to learn the language. We joked that we went there without really knowing the language. We knew some words like, you know, we knew tacos and, you know, (laughs) chili and all of that. I I even know how to ask where the bathroom was, donde esta el baño, you know, all of the important phrases, but we really didn't know Spanish and to minister to the Mexican people, we needed to learn their language. So, the language school that we attended there in Querétaro, Mexico, taught us using what they called patterns or or frequently used phrases. What they would do is we would go into class, and obviously they taught us vocabulary, but, but, but they gave us this book that had these language patterns in them, and what they would do is every day they would teach us a series of phrases or patterns, and then we would go out into the community and use the phrases and patterns that we had learned that day. For example, the very first day we came in, and, and the phrases, they taught us four patterns that day, four phrases. They taught us, buenos dias. Buenas tardes, buenas noches, and I believe they taught us that they also, cuanto cuesta, how much does it cost, and, and then they sent us out, and they said, okay, you got to go out and practice, I think we had to do, what, an hour or two hours a day out communicating, so they sent us out to the streets, so Vicky and I literally walked the streets of Querétaro, and we would look at people trying to speak, and whether it was in the afternoon, we'd say, buenas tardes, and people would say, buenas tardes, back to us, and we must have said it really well, because then they just started talking, and we knew, we, we, we didn't know what else to say you know we just look at him and say buenas noches and then or or we could look at him and say cuanto cuesta how much does it cost that's all we knew and so we began learning those patterns little by little they taught us more patterns and so after a few days they caught us to say como te llamas what is your name me llamo brian burkholder my name is brian burkholder uh la comida está muy rica uh the food is very good or el coche va muy rápido and so they would just teach us the these verb noun patterns and they would tell us go out and use them repeat them over and over and over again 
The idea was by repeatedly using the same patterns, we would eventually learn the language. Guess what? It worked, all right? We can decently communicate in Spanish today. Now, now, my reason for saying that is because I believe that the same formula can be used as you and I learn to pray. In, in, in a very real sense, prayer is a language. There is a, there is a prayer language where we, we learn how to pray. And, and we can take many of the same biblical patterns and apply them to our prayer life. That's exactly, by the way, what Jesus was doing in, in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9 when Jesus looked at the disciples and he actually said this. He said, pray like this. And then he gave them the Lord's Prayer, a prayer that many of us have used and a prayer that many of us have repeated. The Lord is saying, listen, here's a, here's a prayer pattern that, that you can use to teach you how to pray. I say that this morning because all of us need lessons in prayer. Do you agree with me today? All of us need lessons in prayer. None of us pray like we should. None of us pray as often as we should. And none of us pray with the effectiveness that we could or should have. I have to confess that every time I I approach a message on prayer. I am incredibly convicted. I wish I could stand before you today as one of your pastors and say, man, I just got this awesome prayer life and I pray more than I should. I spend way too much time praying. But that's not the case. Prayer is a work in progress in my life and and I am learning how to pray and I need to learn how to pray. Our theme for 2019 is Pray Believing. We, we began the year with a 21-day fast in which we dedicated ourselves to prayer. And since that time, we have seen God do some absolutely astounding, amazing, miraculous things in our families and in our congregation. Today, we want to begin a, a series that we'll kind of walk through during the summer that we've simply titled Praying Scripture using God's Word when you don't know what to say, or using God's Word when you don't know what to pray. Have you ever found yourself in this situation? You want to pray for something, or or you want to pray for an extended period of time, and, and you don't know what to say? Maybe you exhaust all of your prayer requests, you exhaust everything that you know what to say, and it still seems insufficient. There have been times in my life where I've sat down and said, okay, today I'm going to dedicate 30 minutes in prayer. Okay, Lord, so I'm going to start right now, and I'm going to spend the next 30 minutes in prayer. And I pray through everyone I know, I pray through every situation I know, I pray through every prayer request I know, and then I peek at my watch... And I think, oh my word, I've only prayed six minutes. <laughs> Have you ever been there and you think, oh my word, what am I going to do for the next 24 minutes? What am I going to say for the next 24 minutes? I believe the answer, quite frankly, is to pray Scripture. To take God's Word and use God's Word as a pattern, as a guide for your prayer life. During the summer, we will be studying many of the prayers of the Bible. Beginning next week, we're going to walk through the prayers of the Bible. We will, we will learn their stories. We will understand their context. More importantly, though, we want to learn how we can pattern our prayers after the prayers of the Bible. So, so this summer, I want to learn to pray better. And I want you to learn to pray better as we use God's Word as our guide. 
So today we begin in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We're actually going to look at two passages of Scripture. We're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and then if you just want to grab your Bible and turn with me or to Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to be there as well. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, just three verses, verses 3, 4, and 5. Notice what Paul says. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. So, so we walk in the flesh, we're living here on earth, we have this physical existence. Though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. But we have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take captive or take every thought captive to obey Christ. So this morning we kind of want to flesh that out and we want to lay a foundation for the importance of praying Scripture. If you have your, your outline in front of you, the very first thing that I wrote down as I was thinking through this passage was this simple truth. Physical weapons don't win spiritual battles. Does that make sense this morning? Physical weapons don't win spiritual battles. That's what Paul is saying in verse 4. In verse 4 he says, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. So, so as we're involved in this spiritual battle, it's not fleshly, earthly weapons that we can use to win those victories. I enjoy collecting weapons from different parts of the world. The Lord's allowed me to travel some, and, and obviously we have missionaries in different parts of the world, and I kind of enjoy collecting weapons from different parts of the world. So if you come in my office, it's a little bit like an international arsenal. And so I have, for example, I have a machete from Central America, all right? Um, I have a uh, boomerang from Australia. Haven't learned how to use this yet, but uh, maybe one day we'll go out in the parking lot and practice, all right? I have, a, uh, I have a spear from Burkina Faso, West Africa, and so this was something that Mike gave me that I treasure, and I have, I have a war club from the Maasai tribe in Africa. This might not look like much, but I'm telling you, you do not want to get hit by one of these things. Sometimes people say, Brian, how do you handle the staff, and how do you keep the staff in line? It's this thing right here. This is exactly what it is. These are, these are, these are cool, wonderful weapons. And as cool and wonderful as these weapons are, though, they do not help me, nor can they help you in your spiritual battles. It's not like I can take this club and drive Satan off, or I can take my machete and attack you know, the demons. I just can't do that. These are wonderful weapons. They work against physical enemies, but here's what Paul is saying. The weapons of our warfare are different. They are not carnal. They are not physical. Our physical weapons do not work in our spiritual battles. We can go farther, and so today, let's not talk about weapons. Let's talk about the things uh, upon which we depend, our intelligence, our education, our, our charisma, our ability to win and influence people, our, our economic status. If we're not careful, those are things that we use in our life to help us gain an advantage. If we're not careful, it's very easy for us to sit back and think those same things that I use to gain an, an advantage in the physical world, I can use them to gain advantage in the spiritual world. And Paul says that simply is not the truth. Physical weapons don't win spiritual battles. As potent as those weapons are, they're not powerful enough to win spiritual battles. You and I need something more powerful. Why is that? Just a couple of things that I fleshed out that's in your outline there. The first is this. You must realize that many of your daily struggles are spiritual and not physical. You and I must realize that many of our daily struggles are spiritual and not physical. That, that's a truth, quite frankly, that we often fail to grasp. 
You and I have an enemy who is hard at work, who is doing his dead level best to discourage you, to disillusion you, to defeat you. He will use your present circumstances. He will use your personal relationships. He will use your workplace problems to cause you to question your faith, to cause you to fail to trust, and to cause you to lose hope in Him. That is a reality. Every single day of our lives, you and I are under spiritual attack. And often, quite frankly, we fail to realize that. That's what the Apostle Paul is talking about here in the passage. Let me say it a second way. The second thing I wrote down is this. You are constantly wrestling against evil spiritual forces. They're not my words, they're Paul. Go back to the the passage in Ephesians that we alluded to. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. Look at these verses. We'll put them up on the screen. Paul says, finally, be strong in whom? Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might or the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil or the schemes of the devil. Notice this. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Sometimes I sat back and thought, man, I wish my enemies were physical. I wish the enemy was someone that I could just say, okay, right here, let's arm wrestle right now, okay? And if I beat you, I win, and you leave me alone, all right? Let's go out there in the parking lot, and let's take care of it. I wish it was that simple, but it's not. Paul says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against rulers, authorities, the cosmic powers over this present darkness against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. The words rulers, authorities, cosmic powers, and spiritual forces are different terms that refer refer obviously to non-humans. They are spiritual adversaries. And quite frankly, church, because we cannot see them because they're not actively present, visibly present in our lives, we fail to comprehend, we fail to realize the spiritual battle we find ourselves in day after day. And so we have struggles, we're defeated, we're frustrated, we're discouraged, and we attribute that to the physical things that are taking place in our life, but we fail to realize that many of those are spiritual realities. They're spiritual battles that are taking place in our life, and we're trying to fight them with our own abilities. We're trying to fight them with our own weapons, and we live in a defeated state. The Apostle Paul is saying, listen, you cannot win spiritual battles with physical weapons. He says a a second thing. The second reason we need spiritual weapons, it's it's in verse 4. Notice verse 4 once again. He says, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but we have divine power to destroy. Notice what he says, to destroy strongholds. The word stronghold there in the passage is is an interesting word. It literally means fortress. I just spoke in Spanish a few moments ago. The, the Spanish word is fortalezas. It's, it's fortress. It's, a, it's this castle. It, it, it has the idea of something that is impenetrable. The word that the Apostle Paul uses, it's a picture analogy of this castle that's literally built there in the rock. It's solid. It is almost completely impenetrable. And Paul says you and I have what he calls strongholds in our life. I showed you, I, I put just a couple of pictures. I'm not sure if you saw them. There's a, there's a fort in India. Some of these pictures. Can we put those back up? Did we put those up lines already? Or, or the, no, not that one. Not that one. Huh? Boy, that guy's good looking. There, 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 there we go. There, 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 there's a fort in India. And then the next one is the Rock of Gibraltar, which you've seen and heard before. So that, that's the idea, the, the visible picture that the Apostle Paul is painting. He says there are these, there are these strongholds, there are these, these castles, there are these things that, that have been built into your life that are almost impenetrable. And you are trying to attack them with the meager, impotent weapons that you have, and you're not winning the victory. So he's saying, you and I, 
We've got to stop using physical weapons. We've got to stop trying to do these things in our own power. Strongholds can only be destroyed with spiritual weapons. You sit back and say, okay, Brian, so what does that look like in my life? What, what does a stronghold look like in my life or yours? Here's what I put in your notes. A stronghold, and this is what Paul says, is an argument, an idea, or an action that goes against the knowledge of God. That's what Paul says there in the passage. He talks about these strongholds that go against. Verse 5, we destroy arguments in every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. Paul looked upon the arguments of his opponents and as Paul wrote this, Paul was defending his apostolic ministry. And Actually what Paul is realizing, he's in the midst of a battle and he realized that the battle that he is in is not just against the false teachers that he's facing. It's not just against the people who are at the other side of the table. But Paul realizes that he's in the middle of a spiritual battle. And so Paul is, is facing the arguments of his opponents and he's viewing those arguments as fortress walls that are standing up supposedly against the knowledge of God. And Paul says that those walls can only come down through the divine weapons of God. So, 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 so let me pause for a second. Let's ask this question. What are, what are the fortresses, what are the strongholds in your life. Because you and I probably aren't fighting the same battle that the Apostle Paul was fighting. He was fighting against false teaching and he was actually fighting against false accusations at this point. And, 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 and you might not be fighting the same battle, but that doesn't mean that there aren't strongholds in your life or mine. There are strongholds. What are the stronghold in your life? What is the argument, idea, or action in your life that goes against the knowledge of God? Maybe it's a deep-seated inability to believe portions of the Bible. Maybe you sit back today and say, man, Brian, you know, there's portions of the Bible I believe, but man, there's just some things in Scripture that's just, it's almost too hard for me to comprehend. And, and I just don't believe it. It's a stronghold in your life. Maybe it's a lack of trust that God can really, really take care of your needs. Maybe it's like we say in our Celebrate Recovery, it's a hurt, it's a habit, or it's a hang-up. It's something that's got control of your life, and God knows you have tried your dead level best to overcome it. You've tried, but you just can't. It's a stronghold in your life. Maybe it's a relationship that's taking you the wrong direction away from God. And you just can't seem to escape that relationship. Whatever it is, it's like a fortress that cannot be penetrated. All of your good intentions, all of your repeated attempts to overcome it have ended in failure. And you always end up back at the same problem over and over and over again. So much so that if you were honest, you throw up your hands. Say, I don't think this temptation, I don't think this doubt, I don't think this situation can ever be overcome. God knows I've tried my best, but I just can't win this victory. It's a stronghold in your life. Notice the, the next thing I wrote in my notes is this. A stronghold, though, cannot be ignored. A stronghold cannot be swept away. Can't be swept under the rug and forgotten. Here's what Paul says. It must be demolished. A stronghold must be demolished. He uses the word destroy in the passage, and the word destroy actually has the idea to pull down, to tear down, to demolish. Many historians believe that the Apostle Paul was actually making reference to some of the Sicilian wars and how they came in and they had torn down some 200 different castles and 200 different strongholds, and he, he was painting that word 
picture. Paul is saying what happened there is what needs to happen in your life, in my life. That stronghold, that thing that you cannot overcome, that victory that you would love to have, but it is outside of your reach. Paul says you can't do it yourself, but it needs to be demolished. Paul says that a spiritual stronghold can only be demolished with spiritual weapons. So I've talked through all of this, and here's what I wrote in my notes. You might be sitting back saying, okay, Brian, you're proving your point. (laughs) All right. We need spiritual weapons. There's battles in my life that I'm continuing to face that I just can't win the victory over. But what are these spiritual weapons? And where in the world can I find them? That's what Paul makes reference to in the passage. The third thing that I wrote in my notes is this. You and I have been given two powerful spiritual weapons. Notice what Paul says, verse 4. I keep repeating it over and over again, but it's so true. Paul says, the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. Uh, I correlate that so closely with what Paul is teaching in Ephesians chapter 6. Where Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6, once again, that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers. There's these spiritual battles that are taking place. And so after saying all of that in Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 12, in verse 13, Paul says, so here's the solution to this spiritual battle that you're in. Paul says, so, Ephesians 6, 13, take up the whole armor of God. Many of, you, many of you know that passage. I'm not going to read it all. Paul says, put on the belt, belt of truth. Paul says, put on the breastplate of righteousness. Put on the shoes of the gospel of peace. Put on the shield of faith. Put on the helmet of salvation. Those are great defensive things to wear. And I trust that you are wearing those because you are constantly being bombarded with the darts of the enemy. But if you read those like I do, you sit back and say, wait a second, those, the, those offer great protection, but they do nothing to help counterattack the assaults of the enemy. They help protect me, but how can I counterattack? How can I literally not just defend myself and do the old Muhammad Ali rope-a-dope and, and, and not allow myself to get hit? How can I actually win the victory in my life? What are the weapons that I can use to win the victory? Well, you got to keep reading because Paul alludes to it in verse 17. He says, and take the helmet of salvation. We've already mentioned that. Notice what he says. And the sword of what? The Spirit, which is the Word of God. And then he ties that in saying, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Hebrews 4.12, many of you know the verse, Paul says, or the writer of Hebrews says, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It has the power to pierce. It has the power to divide. It has the power to discern the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So here's what Paul is saying, all right? Not profound, but deep. Paul is saying the two major weapons with divine power that you and I have are the Word of God and prayer. Would you repeat that with me today? The Word of God and prayer. Okay, that was about three of you. Repeat that with me again if you would. The Word of God and prayer. The two weapons that we have to win spiritual battles are the Word of God and prayer. Notice that Paul says that these two weapons don't just have power. These two weapons have divine power. It's interesting. So to understand it, it's easier to understand the word that he uses. And we can paint the picture in our English language because the word that Paul uses for the word power there is the word from which we get our word dynamite. Comes from that root. 
So, so here's what Paul is saying. With his word and prayer, God has handed us two sticks of dynamite that we can use to demolish strongholds. That we can use to overcome temptation. That we can use to restore relationships. That we can use to gain victory over an addiction or to build our faith. That's what Paul is saying in the passage. Paul is saying, listen, the weapons of our warfare are powerful. The weapons of our warfare are dynamite. They're two sticks of dynamite. I know today I'm, I'm looking at people who have been believers for a period of time. Some of you are. I'm sure there's people here that haven't been a believer. Maybe you're here and you're still trying to figure all of this out. I get that. Many of you would sit back and say, okay, Brian, I get it. The Word of God, I, I do my best to spend time in the Word of God every day. And, and Brian, I try my best to spend a few moments in prayer. And so I get the fact that those two weapons are important for me. And I'm trying my best to use them to the best of my ability. I, I grab my iPhone on the way to work and I read my, you know, the U version of the Bible or I listen to it. And while I'm in traffic, I'm praying, you know, God help me not to run into the person beside me. Or, and so I'm, I'm working on all of that. I get how they're spiritual weapons. But here's what I want you to see. And here's something that I think God is teaching me as I work through this in my own life. Think through this today. Just a, a simple thought. What is stronger than two sticks of dynamite placed in separate locations? So today, if I took two sticks of dynamite, not going to have it, all right? Chris, our police officer, would come and tackle me if I had two sticks of dynamite here, all right? If I had two sticks of dynamite, and I said, okay, I'm going to put one in the gymnasium, and I'm going to put one on this side of the building, at the count of 60 seconds, they're going to explode, and boom, they go off. And we do damage over there, and we do damage over here. What would be more destructive than two sticks of dynamite in two different locations? Two sticks of dynamite together. If I put two sticks of dynamite together, it creates what? It creates more havoc. It creates more destruction. It can bring down more impenetrable strongholds. You said, Brian, what, what does all of that mean? Here's, here's what I'm getting to, and here's what we want to accomplish through our series this summer. Here's what I believe. When used together... God's word and prayer provide the believer with incredible spiritual power. Let me say it again. When used together, God's word and prayer provide the believer incredible spiritual power. Paul, Paul fleshes it out. Paul says in verse 5, he said, here's what it does. It destroys arguments and opinions raised against God. So, so, so let me summarize what he's saying. Prayer in God's word does what? It changes hearts. It, it destroys arguments. The, these opinions that have been raised against God that, that humanly, with my own intellect, I cannot refute, I cannot defeat. When God's word and prayer are joined together, they become this powerful force. These two sticks of dynamite together, which can destroy that. Paul says it takes thoughts captive to obey Christ. Oh my word, I wish I could... Just have the guys sit here for a second. Let's talk about our thought life, guys. Let's talk about controlling our thoughts. How in the world do we take those thoughts that don't honor God and bring them under captivity? So our thoughts, as Paul says in Romans chapter 12, our mind is being renewed and we don't think the things that we used to think. But now, the Word of God is changing our mind. It's renewing our mind. It takes those old sinful thoughts and it makes them captive and it brings them into obedience of Christ. How does that happen? Paul says, the weapons of our warfare 
are not impotent. The weapons of our warfare are powerful. God's Word and prayer together create incredible power for the believer. Over the next few months, we want to flesh out that truth for you. So today's just a foundation. Just trying to lay it out so you know what we want to accomplish throughout the summer. So, so, so we want to take the prayers of the Bible, the inspired prayers of the Bible, and we not only want to study their stories, we not only want to study their context, we not only want to see who prayed them and, and why they prayed them and what was the context of when it was prayed, but we want to take those prayers and see, okay, how can those prayers help me in my prayer life? How can those prayers become a pattern to me so that I can learn how to pray? Just like those patterns help Brian and Vicky learn Spanish. How can I take the prayer patterns of God's Word and make them such a part of my life that they teach me to pray? And all of a sudden, those prayer things become such a natural part of who I am that my prayer life flourishes and I begin to use God's own Word in my prayer life. Listen, our theme this year is pray believing. Pray believing. Let's be honest. So many times when we pray to our, with our own mindset, with our own devices, our prayer life can, can lean towards selfishness, can it not? Our prayer life becomes about us. It becomes about what we want. It becomes about what we think God should do. It becomes about what we think God should be providing us. And it kind of leans our way. Praying Scripture helps us to centralize it a little bit. It helps me to pray with conviction. It helps me to pray with belief. Why is that? I am taking the very words of God, and I am praying those words back to Him. I don't have to doubt whether it's what God wants in my life. I don't have to say, okay, God, if that's what you want, please do it. If not, please do something else. I can take the very words of God, who are the, which are the written, revealed words of God, and I can pray those back to God with confidence, knowing that I'm asking Him to do in my life what He has already promised to do in my life. It gives me confidence in my prayer life. Listen, church, I want you to know I'm on a journey. I'm on a journey. I want to learn how to pray. I want to. I want to pray more. I want to pray more effectively. I want to pray with conviction. And God is teaching me. So, so this is what Brian does. This isn't inspired. This isn't God telling you to do this. This is just what I do. I have a journal that I use every single day. This is my devotional journal. And I can turn to what I did this morning. So this morning I got up and I read Exodus chapter 15, which is just a great passage of Scripture. Exodus 13 and 14, God has just brought, He redeemed the Israelites from Egypt, and they had just come through the Red Sea, and they walked on dry ground, and they were able to look back and see the waters, you know, kind of drowned all of the Egyptians. And chapter 14 says, ends basically saying, and they saw the Egyptians dead on the shore. How cool is that? Chapter 15, chapter 15 is a song of praise to God. After seeing God do the miraculous, they, in my mind, they sat back on the banks of the Red Sea, looked at the bodies of their enemies that they had done nothing to defeat, and they sat there and they sang a praise to God. <laughs> How cool is that? So here's what I wrote. Here's what I prayed as I, as I read through that this morning. Once again, this is just Brian. This is just an example. I prayed, Lord, help me to give you glory for my victories. The Israelites did nothing to win that victory. They just walked. That's all they did. They walked across. It was God who won the victory. 
Lord, Lord, help me never to take credit for what you have done. Help me to celebrate each victory with praise. And then I take some of those verses and I pray them to God. That's just Brian. That's just Brian. I'm, I'm not telling you to do that. Don't feel like you got to go out and buy a black book like mine and use it just like this. Here's what I'm saying, though. I'm saying whenever we take the Word of God and we join the Word of God with the spiritual weapon of prayer, it creates a powerful tool in our lives that God can and will use to bring down strongholds, to win victories, to overcome temptations, to teach us and mold us into who he wants us to be. God's word with prayer will do two things. It will create an increased intimacy with God on your part, and it will increase your faith. Pray scripture. Pray scripture. Rather than sitting back saying, okay, God, I don't know what else to say. I know I need to be spending time with you. I just, I'm not sure what else to say to take God's word and say, okay, God, I'm going to pray your word back to you. As I pray your word back to you, I pray that your word would transform me, mold me, shape me into who you want me to be. Your word is alive, it's powerful, it works in my life. I'm asking you, with your words, to work in my life and trust God to do it. Does that make sense? Let's pray together. Would you stand with me as Jonas comes? Father, remind us today of our brokenness. Remind us today, Lord, that we cannot win victories in our own strength. We try. We fail. We cannot overcome our own temptations and our own weaknesses and our own power. We cannot become who you desire for us to become in our own strength and our own abilities. We desperately need you. Remind us of that today. Remind us that you have already given us everything we need for godliness and righteousness. You've given us spiritual weapons to win the victory. So I pray you would help us as your people, as we seek you, as we learn to pray. God, I pray that you would help us to use your word and prayer together as the weapons that will enable us to win the spiritual victories that you desire for us to win. But thank you so much for Jesus. I pray if there's somebody here this morning that has never surrendered their life to Jesus Christ, that this morning they would realize that that is the starting place, that they need Jesus in their life. So Lord, in their heart, I pray that they would reach out to you and by faith, trust in Jesus. Do a work in our hearts, speak to us individually, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.